There are eight mistakes I see producers making all the time which ruins their mixes and in this video I'm going to show you what those mistakes are, how to avoid or fix them which will instantly make your music sound better. Here's an example of a trap before we apply these mixing tips. And here's what it sounds like afterwards. My students have applied these mixing tips in Ableton, Logic, FL Studio across multiple genres and now their music is being released on some of the world's biggest labels so these tips really do work. Okay, without further ado, let's hop into the door and get it done. The first and foremost mistake is simply mixing too loud. Now there are two parts to this problem, both of them equally important. The first thing is simply starting your mix too loud. If you load in a sample that's peaking at 0 dB, which would usually be the kick, and you mix everything to work around that, the chances are you're final mix is going to end up way too loud and distorted. Whereas if you anchor your kick to about minus 12 dB peak, when you mix everything else up around it, you should still have plenty of headroom on your master channel. Here's an example. At the moment we can see our kick is peaking at 0 dB, we can see that is reflected in the master channel as well. So let's just take that down 12 dB, so it's peaking at minus 12, add all our other elements in, and keep an eye on the master channel. See plenty of headroom, perfect to enter the mastering stage. Now the second part of this first point is mixing into a mastering limiter. Now that obviously makes everything sound a lot fatter and nice, so let's just check it out. Because it's all being limited. Now I used to do this loads, especially when Reason, the DAW I used to use, released their first limiter, I would limit everything. But after a couple of years of doing that, I realized I could get way better mixes if I didn't do it. Why is that? Well, a mastering chain can be very forgiving and mask a lot of mistakes that we're making. So if you're not a skilled mixer yet, the chances are you're just gonna be kidding yourself. As Almost everything sounds cooler when it's pushed through a limiter, but it's one of the main reasons why your final product never can get as loud or as clear and as crisp as your favorite producers. It's because you haven't been able to hear the mistakes you've been making. Now, yes, I know some big name producers do mix into the mastering chain and it's not a problem per se, but those guys know what they're doing. If you're just learning to mix, having a limiter on the master channel is gonna make it harder to actually improve your mixing skills. So my personal recommendation is leave that limiter off until you get to the mastering stage and just have a mono switch on the master channel like this so you can check your mix in mono and make sure all the levels are balanced. There are a couple of other plugins you'll see on my master chain as well and we're going to get to those in a couple of minutes. Okay on to mistake number two and that is mixing without a reference track. Mixing without a reference track is a bit like driving at night without any headlights on probably. Anyway my point is if you don't know what you're aiming for it's going to be very hard to hit it and every producer and mixing engineer I've ever met uses reference tracks to benchmark their own mix and make sure they're on the right path. Otherwise, it's very easy to lose objectivity, especially if you've been working on a track for a while, which I'm sure you can relate to. So here's how I do it. I create a new audio track in my DAW. Again, it doesn't matter which one you are using. Then I drag in the reference track. Now you want to make sure that your reference track has been synced to your project and warped correctly, and that makes looping it much easier. Then I will just loop the busiest part of that reference track alongside the busiest part of my track that I'm mixing and then we can compare like for like. There's a couple more steps we need to take first though. First is to attenuate the volume of the reference track by about 12 dB peak usually. You can see I've done it slightly less because this is a slightly quieter track. And this is where we get into these other plugins I've got on both my master chain and the reference track chain. So I've got this loudness meter, Yulian loudness meter here to measure average volume, and I've got this span, which is a spectrum analyzer. Both of those are free and I'll link to them below. And we've got this EQ8 as well, and I'm gonna show you what to do with that in a couple of steps time. But firstly, let's just check the Yulian loudness meter. Now, we want to get this to be an average volume of about minus 18 integrated in the LUFs. It doesn't have to be super accurate, we can see we're more or less there. And that means that if our kick is anchored to about minus 12 dB peak, as we touched upon in the last point, by the end of the entire mix, ours is probably going to be hitting around minus 18 luffs as well. So I've put a loudness meter on our master channel as well. And if my theory is correct, with our kick peaking at about minus 12, we should be hitting a similar level. Okay. 
to have about almost minus 18 on the integrated lofts. Perfect, absolutely perfect. Who'd have thought, eh? Now the major benefit of that is we can now compare our tracks and listen to them and contrast them side by side with our reference track. And you can do that just by soloing the reference track and then turning it off and hearing our track. And let's have a quick listen. Okay, similar vibe, I like it. And what's more, using this Voxengo span, we can actually view the reference track frequency spread and ours side by side. And we can see how far we are from a similar spread. This is such a powerful tool to use. So mistake number three is thinking that the mix will fix bad composition and sound selection. All the mix can do is enhance what's already there. You can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. So we have to be ruthless about choosing the right sounds. It's so much more worth spending the time near the beginning of the production process picking sounds that are gonna work together. Now, if you're working in a rock band, that job's kind of done for you. You know there's gonna be a guitar, you know there's gonna be drums, a bass, and vocals. But with electronic music production, we've obviously got many more choices at our disposal. Now this again is where the reference track comes in useful because you can just loop a small section of that reference track and really try and pick apart what separate sounds are in there. You know, what kind of kick is there? What kind of open hat or shaker is there? What kind of sounds are in the background? Okay, so there's like a rim shot there instead of a clap or a, a snare. And that's exactly the kind of detail you need to try and get the right sounds. So let me give you an example of the difference this can make to a track. I'm now gonna switch out the kick in our track to one that doesn't fit quite so well and listen to the difference that it make that a mix will never be able to fix. Here's the kick. And no amount of mixing is gonna fix that. Now let's compare it to the kick I had before. Just completely changes the feel of the whole track. Hey, I know this one isn't a mixing tip, but I really just wanna save you as much time as possible. Spend that time getting the right sounds and composition before you even start mixing. Now, in terms of what reference track to pick, it should be in the same genre that you're producing or as close as possible. And ideally it should be from within the last couple of years to make sure that it sounds modern and that your mix is gonna sound modern too. Ideally you want it to be in the same key as yours and I'm gonna show you why in a couple of steps. It's not essential, but it is ideal if it's all possible. Okay, mistake number four, is not sorting out the low end of your mix first. Now the low end, especially with electronic music, is so important because the waves of bass frequencies are so much larger than the higher frequencies and when they clash, it can create a horrible, wobbly, fat, flabby, muddy mix. So it's important to get that nailed in pretty early on in the mixing process. So here's how you can do it. If we go to our reference track, we can put on an EQ and take out all of the high frequencies, about 150, maybe 120 hertz, Basically, we just wanna hear the thump of the kick and the bass. So that's too low. So we're gonna to aim to get our low end to have a similar amount of energy. Now, the way that we can do this, we can copy that EQ, we can put it on the master channel, again, before the span, and you'll see why in a couple of minutes. And now we can just switch between the two. And if you've anchored your kick to be peaky at about minus 12, the kick kind of should have already been set. So then it's just a case of bringing in the bass line until it sounds at a kind of similar energy level when you switch between your reference track and your track. Now, you can actually visually see what's going on as well. So if we open up the span on our reference track after that filter cut off, we can see it's just the low end here and we can open that on ours as well. So this is the reference track and this is ours. So we can actually see whether ours is hitting at a similar level as the reference track. And this is why if your reference track is in the same key as your track, it's easier because we can hear that the reference track bass sounds higher, but that's because it's a few notes up. It's in a different key to our track. So if our track was in the same key, it would make this whole process easier, but this is how you can balance the low end early on in the process. Boom, you now have a solid foundation on which to base the rest of your mix. Try this out. Honestly, let me know in the comments, does this work for you? Does it make your music sound better? I want to know. Okay, next mistake I see producers making all the time is about the stereo width and the panning. Now this isn't a massive problem, but it's such a simple one to fix, I wanted to touch upon it. So when people are panning stuff, quite often they'll choose to pan them wherever they want, all over 
over the place, but the core elements should have a central balance. Now, a lot of people think that means it should be mono or that it shouldn't have stereo width or it shouldn't be panned left or right, but that's not what I mean. If you envisage it like a seesaw, by balance, we just want that seesaw to be more or less level. It doesn't mean that it all has to be mono in the center. So for example, the core elements of your track will want to have a central balance. That would be the kick, the main clap or snare, the main open hat, and the main lead vocal or lead synth. And again, it doesn't really matter which genre you're producing. So let me give you an example about how we can add some stereo width and interest in the stereo field without putting things out of balance. So we've got our kick and our drums. It's all pretty central at the moment. You can hear that we've got the tom drums with a bit of stereo width, which is absolutely fine because they're not core elements. So let's try and make some of those core elements wider without pushing things out of balance. So first we've got our hat, which is this shaker sound. Now if we load in another shaker sound, like so, make sure they're both programmed in, and then we could pan one left and one right. So it's gonna sound wide, but the balance is still gonna be central. So let's pan one out left and one out right and listen to the difference it makes. So now we've got this really wide shaker sound. Again, we could do that with the main clap or snare. So the main snare in this is actually a rim shot. But if we add a couple of clap sounds, like so, we can pan one left and one right, and then we've got the rim shot in the center. So overall, that seesaw is in balance. And listen how wide it sounds now. Now for the other sounds that bounce around it, like this 16th hat, what you can do is add something like an auto pan. And that's just gonna have that panning left and right. So that was a really quick one, but just remember, you're always trying to get your mix in balance on that seesaw. Okay, mistake number six, and that is not using a global room reverb. So these are our drums beforehand. And now let's turn on that global room reverb. Off and on. And this is what it sounds like on its own. Hear how much more lively and glued together those drums sounded? Here's how you do it. So if you're using Ableton, you can just create an auxiliary channel with Command, Shift and T or go up to the menu and create return track. It means the same thing and then add a reverb on there with quite a short decay time. About four to 500 milliseconds is usually good. Then we're just boosting up the volume a little bit because the Ableton reverb volume makes things a little bit quiet. And then I've just done some EQ after the fact, giving it a high end boost and taking out the low end under about 120 Hertz because we don't want reverb below about 120 Hertz. It's just gonna make the mix more muddy. Now, if we go to our drum rack over here, press this button here, this routing button, and then the R button here, which means return. We can right click and create return chain. And I've already done that, but you can choose which of your auxiliary channels you want to be able to apply within the drum rack. So I've chosen the room reverb. We can now close up that routing, make sure the S is turned on. And now we can just feed a little bit of each drum into this return chain. And it's just gonna allow you to really gel things together. Okay, next mistake I see in amateur mixes, and this is something I used to be guilty of, especially when I discovered saturation, is overcooking the high end. Now, quite often we will listen to tracks and the high end in our reference track sounds really good, really clear, really crisp, and then we think, okay, to do that, we need to boost the high end of everything in our mix. But the trouble with that is, if everything is boosted and everything has got high end, it's almost like nothing has high end because the whole thing has to be relative. So this is an example of what a track might sound like if the high end has been overcooked because we've boosted the vocals, we've boosted the drums, we've boosted the high end of everything we really want to shine in the mix. And this is what it can end up sounding like. So it can end up be quite brittle. And if we can compare that to our reference track, where the high end is all nice and clear, we can hear what the problem is. So let's take off some of those high-end frequency boosts and just add it to a couple of elements, namely 
the vocals, and maybe a little bit on the hats. And by contrast, everything else is going to be slightly duller in the mix, but it gives those high-end elements more room to breathe. Okay, so firstly, let's take off the boost in our synth riff. Let's go to our pads. We've got some saturation here. Let's turn that off. And we're actually going to roll off a lot of the high frequencies. So our pads on their own kind of sound dull, but that's okay. Now let's go to the piano, which is already quite kind of dull because of the actual sound source. So that one's actually absolutely fine. Now with the vocals, we've probably boosted these a little bit much. A little bit too bright, so let's just take that off and take off the saturation. We've still got a bit of a boost. But it's just less intense. Now let's go to the bass. That's all sub bass anyway, so there's nothing that we've boosted there. Now with the drums, we've added some sizzle with a saturator. So we're going to turn that one off as well, actually. And then with the kick, we'll turn off that saturation there and leave that a little bit lower in the mix. So now let's listen to the difference that's made. It's allowing that vocal to now cut through the mix because it's not fighting the high end with everything else. So the final mistake I see people making is not using bus processing. So people often think that the mastering process is gonna fix a bad mix or at least make it better. But in my opinion, if you can get your track sounding as good as your reference track, just a bit quieter, before you even hit the master channel, you're in for a way better end result. So bus processing is a big part of that. So let's just hop into the door and I'll give you a couple of examples of where you might use it. So I always use it on the kick and the bass. I group them together, which is another way of sending them to a bus. And that means both things are being processed by one set of plugins or devices. So in this instance, I've added a decapitator to add a little bit of saturation in the low end and warm, warm it up a bit. So let's turn that on. Just subtle. And again, it might be more extreme if you're producing a more in your face genre of music. And then I'm gonna add some glue compression, which is just gonna make everything a bit more glued together in that low end. So that's a really useful kick and bass bus that I always use. Then on the drums, we've got our drums, which we can process together. So we've got all our separate drums here, and then they're all going through, and you know, that can all be closed down. And they're all going through an EQ, and a drum bus in Ableton, which is basically a way to add some distortion and some compression. It's all quite subtle, but let's turn those off. And that's the difference we've got. So bus processing is going to help polish up that sound. And let's have a listen to this pad. So we've got one, two, three, four different pads. And if we turn off the bus processing, this is what we have when they're all processed separately, which is really nice. But now let's glue everything together with this bus processing. Hear how much more upfront and in your face it is. So yeah, bus processing is an absolutely is an absolutely essential skill to learn to get your mixes up to a professional level. Now you can go super in depth with bus processing, and there are various pros and cons to bussing different things with other things. But a good general rule of thumb is, if you want things to sound like they're being glued together, consider sending them all to one bus. So we've covered loads of really powerful mixing tips today, but there's one that we've only just touched upon, and that is gain staging, which is really just managing the levels of all of your elements across the entire signal path. Now, when you get gain staging right, Right, it's going to be game changing for your mixes. So I've put together the seven mistakes I see producers making all the time when it comes to gain staging and how to fix them. You can check that video out there, but before you do, please like this video. And if you enjoyed it, comment below and consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I will catch you over at that next video.